I get excited when I pause and think about God again. Because I don't know anyone who has a military record with no defeats. <laughs> I don't have any friends other than Jesus that can face tomorrow without even a dribble of fear. But I want you to know that as a church and as a people, we are all on the border of a time that is hardly imagined. That's why this title is significant to me, and I'll tell you about it in a moment. Some of you are ahead of me on the curve. I'd like you to slow down and wait for me to catch up. Others of you are probably wondering, where did he get that title from? Well, you know, we live in an age where media has a lot to do with how we think and how we function. And God has given us intense understanding. And when you study God's Word, a preacher led of God's Holy Spirit can find an object lesson in everything. So, but I want you today to be, here's my favorite word, I want you to be calibrated to hear what God has to say to you through his Holy Spirit. So bow your heads with me as we approach this very challenging topic entitled The Tomorrow War. Let us pray. Loving, gracious Father in heaven, the privilege may be ours, but the work is yours. Lord, never allow us to stand here and take the glory that belongs only to you. And even as you use my voice and the work that you have called me to do in putting this message together, I pray that your people can hear how it applies to each of their lives. They can glean from it the spiritual nourishment that each one of us is in need of to be ready for the tomorrow war. Send your holy angels to surround this place and minister to us and your Holy Spirit to keep us alert. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to begin with the scripture from Deuteronomy. This is our scripture reading for the day. The Deuteronomy, chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. You can follow along in your Bible, but it's also on the screen. Deuteronomy 20, verses 1 to 4. And the Lord, through that faithful man named Moses, gives us these ancient words with contemporary application. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be when you are on the verge of the battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people, and he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, this is significant. Today you are on the verge of, the, of battle with your enemies. I'm going to say that again. Today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid. And do not tremble or be terrified because of them. Praise God. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Can the church say amen? amen. What a powerful passage. If you've ever had battles, you need to read that passage every time a battle starts. Whatever the nature of the battle God is saying, I will go with you 
to fight for you against your enemies. And thus I say, one plus God is the majority. When you have God on your side, you don't need anybody else. When God is with you, who can be against you? When God shows up, it doesn't matter who doesn't. <laughs> when God answers the call, it doesn't matter who didn't pick up the phone. When God is on the battlefield, that's all you need. He that is with us is more than he that is against us. They that be with us are more than they that be against us. Now for the title. Through movies and media and music and any form of communication, oftentimes imaginary scenarios are drawn in the minds of the listening audience. Once a seed is planted, that seed will germinate either sooner or later. And media moguls have the amazing ability to plant a thought in the minds of society that somebody will grab onto and carry out an act either sooner or later that is perpendicular or that is parallel to what they saw in a movie. You know, like little boys, when they see a movie about war, they want to go home and fight. When people watch inspiring movies about an athlete that beat the odds, they want to go home and run. They feel empowered. They feel energetic. When you see a successful story or a love story, if you have a great marriage, you cry together. You laugh together when something funny occurs, and it impresses you for a period that you cannot determine, but whenever you see something that related to what you watched or what you heard, somehow it has a way of getting into your character and causing you to act out what you have perceived. Well, the writers and the directors of this recent movie entitled The Tomorrow War, it is a depiction that in the future, as they said, 30 years from now, according to the writers of the movie, people will come back from the future to the present and would say to us, there is a war that is being fought for the survival of everyone on planet Earth. And the greater good of the world is dependent on the outcome of that war. But we need every one of you able-bodied men and women to enlist in this war because if we lose, in 30 years, the world would cease to exist. But strangely enough, as you look at the unfolding scenario in this movie, the war was not one nation against another. The writers of this dramatization suggested that there are aliens that have inhabited our planets for a specific period of time of which we know not of, and we've got to do whatever we can to rid our world of these invaders, these aliens. Well, so far, it's not different from something you may have seen before. But what caught my attention was the fact that the alien part wasn't startling, but they described these aliens as Sabbath keepers. And if we can rid the world of these Sabbath keepers, then our world will survive. They call them white spikes. White spikes. They suggest that on the, the best time to attack them is on the sixth to the seventh day, because on the sixth day, they, 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 they go back into their reclusive hiding place to keep the Sabbath. And if we, could, if we could attack them then, we have the greater chance to rid the world of them. And I thought to myself, how coincidental. 
that we are on the verge, as the Bible describes, of a war of indescribable proportions. And Satan is marshalling his forces together to fight against those who honor God's Bible Sabbath. I don't believe for a moment that that scenario was incidental or coincidental. I believe that Satan, who controls the minds of these movie makers, instilled and inserted into it some suggestion that when the Sabbath later on becomes an issue, in the context of a world falling apart, like a climate going mad, uncontrollable weather, you cannot reverse the impact of climate change, whether you believe it or not, is not the issue. But when the suggestion is made that if we would all honor one day, then God would be pleased and maybe He could save our planet, there will be a push for the world to coalesce together, unitedly honoring a specific day of the week in an attempt to appease an angry God who, for whatever reason, is punishing our planet because we refuse to honor the day He has us set up. But when that suggestion is made, I can guarantee you they're not going to make any kind of plans to honor the Bible Sabbath. They're going to make plans to honor the day that has been set up through tradition, through time and through darkness and error, the day of the sun. And for those of you that are not even aware of it, it's already underway. The climate accord that's being planned, and I'll give you more details later on in the sermon, there's, always, there's already country leaders getting together trying to figure out ways to cause our world to survive, whether it's green gases, whether it's fossil fuels, whether it's climate, uh, the climate heating up, whatever you might say is happening or isn't happening, the fact of the matter is our world is on the brink of falling apart. And only people that want to close their eyes will say, oh, this is just incidental, I guess it's just as incidental as animals going into the yard two by two and seven by seven. They said it back then too. Well, you know, this happens every once in a while. But to, but to the child of God, something else is taking place. And so when I heard about this and I, my mind was tweaked by a, a link that a number of church members sent me. I don't normally look at these links. But I decided, well, let me go ahead and look at it because the title of the Tomorrow War, you know, pastors like these flashy titles. And when I, when I followed through and began to understand what the movie was all about, I said, the devil is planting the thoughts in the minds of men and women that there are people keeping the Sabbath. They have refused for centuries to lay it down. I've tried to stamp them out during the Dark Ages. That did not work. I raised up powers to try to drive them to extinction, that did not work. And I'm seeking one more way to rid the planet of those that refuse to honor the traditions that I've established to bring honor to me because I did say I will be like the Most High, but they refuse to disconnect themselves from the God of the Sabbath. So I've got to marshal the world together. And as we sit here this morning, Three unclean spirits like frogs are coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets. And they are going forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them together to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And if you think for whatever reason that we are not a part of the extinction clause, then you cannot be awake. Because the devil has never been satisfied when truth is triumphant. And when God's light has continued to grow brighter and brighter, as was the case in the days of Mordecai, and every faithful person that stood through the wars and the battles that are now behind us in the annals of God's history book, every one of them has, to, has been confronted by some force determined to wipe them out. But I'm here to say today, I'm here to say today that God has never lost a battle. And when God stands with you, let me reverse that. When you stand with God, you are on the winning side. God doesn't stand with us unless we are on the side that God is on. He says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. 
So when we draw near to God, know that we are drawing away from the devil. And as we sit here today, we can play church if we want to. But let me tell you something, brethren, there's an urgency that the people of God need to embrace. We need to understand that somewhere along the line, we will be living in the last days. And I would suggest to you today, we are living in the last days. Everything around us is screaming. Even nature itself is saying, we cannot wait to be rescued from what sin has done to our planet. Servant of the Lord in the Signs of the Times magazine, this is a very insightful quotation that I want to share with you before I take your eyes to the screen. Signs of the Times, January 17th, 1884, and paragraph 12. Listen to these very ominous but stimulating words. She writes, Men in responsible positions will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but from the sacred desk will urge upon the people the observance of the first day of the week, pleading tradition and custom in behalf of this man-made institution. They will point, listen carefully, to calamities on land and sea, to the storms of wind, the floods, the earthquakes, the destruction by fire, as judgments indicating God's displeasure because Sunday is not sacredly observed. These calamities will increase more and more. One disaster will follow close upon the heels of another. And those who make void the law of God will point to the few who are keeping the Sabbath of the fourth commandment as the ones who are bringing wrath upon the world. This falsehood is Satan's device that he may ensnare the unwary. What a quotation. And there are people, I'm going to get a little bold here today, there are some people that say Ellen White is out of date and irrelevant. That's your problem. That ain't my problem. When God can inspire someone to give me some, when God can give me eye drops through anybody that is willing to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, I say to God be the glory. This is to me a prognostication of the fact that as the text says, we are on the verge of going to battle against our enemies. And let me make it very clear. Our enemy is Satan himself. Our enemy is not those that go to church on a different day of the week. But if God brings to you light in place of darkness and truth in the place of error and a clear understanding in the place of confusion and then you decide to reject it, before the mark of the beast even comes, you have consented that when the mark of the beast comes, you will be more than willing to receive it. Some people say, well, the mark of the beast hasn't come yet. For some people, it already has. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Because some people have heard the truth of God's word and have recalcitrantly determined to stand against it. And they said, I don't care about the Sabbath. I don't believe it. I'm not going to embrace it. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm happy where I am. They have already spiritually received the mark of the beast in their lives. Because they're saying that when it comes, I will embrace it with my whole heart. So this idea that we have to wait till it comes in order for it to be a real issue, when the issue does arrive, then the world will be confronted by it. But there are those today who are closing their probation on truth because light has come. And as Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And brethren, we are on the verge. Some may suggest that these words are irrelevant to modern times. But in light of the developing climate, the words that I just read seem relevant to me today. They are pregnant with relevance. Praise God for that. Whatever the reason the world is facing a stupendous crisis, whatever the reason the world is on the verge of a crumbling society, like an Oreo cookie in a cup of milk, it's just falling apart. And there's nothing we can do to reverse it. You can't put back a crumbled cookie. And you cannot put back a world that's falling apart. The only answer for our world today is Jesus. 
That's why I say to these young men that are fired, fired up and excited about the gospel, preach it like there's no tomorrow. Proclaim it like it's going to happen in the next 10 seconds. And don't let anybody turn you around. Don't let anybody say to you, well, why are you so passionate? God is not looking for limp people in these closing critical hours. God is looking for men and women that are determined to call it like they see it, like God's world reveals it. Because God's word is sure. We can trust it. And brethren, today, I've had conversations this week from a number of people that have called me. Pastor John Stanton called me, and he and his wife, Rochelle, shared with my wife and I that the world is falling apart. And then another good friend of mine, Greg Mace, who we've known him for 40 years now, in the Heritage Singers, the, Max Mace's son, he called me last night, and with his voice in, in, a, in, a, in a pitch of urgency, he says, John, John, I believe that Jesus can come back in two weeks. Now, he didn't mean that prophecy means that everything is going to happen in two weeks, but he was saying, he says, if you lived in California, you would believe that the world could come to an end in two weeks. I said, what do you mean, Greg? He said, let me tell you something. And I'm going to show you today what he told me. I'm going to show you what Pastor John Stanton told me. Pastor John Stanton called me and he said, oh, we just came back from California. You know, we like to go to California. We, went to, we drove down to California. We went to San Francisco and enjoyed right there by um, the um, Golden Gate Park. Where everybody parks, it's just everybody's out flying kites and roller skating. And it's a very, very stimulating environment. It's great to be there. I mean, my wife and I have done that many times. We just... Pier 39, and you just park your car, and it's safe. But he said, there is a rash as though California has become the blueprint of what's rolling to the east. He says, brazen theft is on the rise. I said, what do you mean, brazen theft? He said, people in broad daylight, in packs and in gangs with masks and guns, are breaking into people's windows while the crowd watch. And, and rummaging and taking whatever they can, and nobody could stop them, not even the police, because they say we can't even prosecute these crimes. And people are videotaping as cars are being broken into in broad daylight. They broke, I'm getting there, and they broke into John's car. My wife is preaching the sermon with me. <laughs> they broke into John's car. He said, I thought it was fine. I mean, I'm a Californian. He said, they stole my backpack. I lost my laptop and my iPad and everything else in my backpack. He said, I, I'm sure I lost about four or $5,000 worth of stuff. And he said, thank God I backed it all up before I left home. Techies know what I mean. But he said, it happened in broad daylight. People saw it happen. Nobody would stop it. The police can't even stop it. Because he said, for whatever reason, that crime is so rampant that they're downgrading the crimes that they would even prosecute. And if, it's, and if they steal something below a certain dollar amount, they're not even going to prosecute them. So people are walking in stores like Walgreens and clearing the shelves and walking out without any resistance. And the security team and the store manager watches them and makes no attempt to stop them. Stores like Macy's and Neiman Marcus in the San Francisco area experience people walking in and just grabbing handbags or whatever they want off the shelves and walking out without any fear of even being stopped. Brazen crimes. And the streets of San Francisco are becoming, he says, John, if, Greg was saying to me, if you go down to San Francisco, that's not the same city that, he said, don't, if whatever you do, don't ever go to San Francisco without your guards up. Because anything could happen at any moment. People are hiring independent security guards to watch their cars while it's in the car, while it's in the um, car garages. They said they're parking garages. They said they're those people that have those upper end cars. They're hiring armed security to watch their cars while they go shopping. Did you ever believe that we would get to that point in society? Here we are sequestered in, 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 in Farmville. And we think that the world is just like this. So today, I want to shock your sensibilities. I'm going to walk you through some of these. Here's a picture of the Walgreens store 
This is in San Francisco. You see on the right, the security guard, and on the left, the store manager, and in the background, there's a guy pillaging. He, he brought, they said, this, I read the article, he brought in a black garbage bag, and he's filling the garbage bag with what he wants. And he gets on his bike, and he rides right past the security guard without any fear of reprisal, and nobody's stopping him. And Walgreens, pharmacy, they said the pharmacy is now being, by, being protected by armed guards with shotguns or whatever. They, they're protecting the pharmacy because they're fearful that these drug lords will come into the store and just start pillaging the pharmacy, taking what they want. So they're protecting the pharmacy. But they said Walgreens is closing their 12 stores in the San Francisco city area because of this kind of happening. Not only that, this is a picture of Neiman Marcus. These guys, they come in with hoods. They cover their faces. They go into the stores and grab whatever they want, and they run out. Read the article. They said Macy's and Neiman Marcus are taking measures into their own hands, these stores in the San Francisco area. So what they're doing is they're putting in security devices in these bags, so that, and they're putting in gates that if you steal something and you're trying to run toward the exit, the gates come down and lock you in. Because he said they can't get help from the police themselves. And if you think I'm making this up, check it out yourself. I don't like sensationalism. I like to tell it like it is. That's just, the, that's just the tip of the iceberg with no fear of reprisal. That's happening in the West. On the other hand, our natural resources are either going up in flames or being washed away in torrential floods. Forests are burning up. The water supply is drying up. Let me take you. This is a map of what's happening starting to the west and going to the east. You'll notice the colors, dry, moderate, severe, extreme, and exceptional. you notice the color exceptional in the Las Vegas area, the Salt Lake City area, the Albuquerque, New Mexico, San Fr all these regions where it's dark red. That means they are already on water rationing. But you'll find out what I mean by that in just a moment. Let me go to the pictures and specifics. This is a picture of Folsom Lake. This is today. We used to live to, we used to, we went to Folsom Lake and did jet skiing before. You see those things to the bottom right? Those are where the boats are normally docked. But there is no water to dock a boat. So they're all empty. These, they're all empty. There's no place, the water is receding at such a rate that, as Greg said to me, he said, this is not Folsom Lake, it's becoming Folsom Desert. Because the water is receding, receding at such an alarming rate. Let's go on further. This is the uh, California Reservoir. The water is down to 17%. What would happen if our water was down to 17% in this area? Do you know what that means? He says right now they're giving people fines if you water their grass. This is in California. This is not in Arizona where they don't normally have a lot of watering taking place. But the challenge here is as the water begins to dry up, the cities like Southern California that this reservoir furnishes, water rationing is going to be take, is already taking place in this state. And people are, people are threatened by fines if they are caught watering their grass. But on the other side of that, they said that there is water crimes happening all around them. Thieves are tapping into the fire hydrants during the night and siphoning water out when people cannot watch and carting them off in truckloads to survive for their own selves. So they're already, in many cases, fighting over something as simple as the resource of water in the West. Let's go further. Let's go further. This, this is Lake Orville. This is by Orville, California. You see the bridge? You see the, you see the river that used to be below it? That's today. That's what's happened in California. But let me shock your sensibilities. Climatologists say that according to what they see, that the West Coast has two more years of drought ahead of them. And this is what happened just between 2020 and 2021. Let's go on. This is the lake in Utah, Utah water crisis. That used to be if you look up that brown line right up here, the water used to be up to that level. Well, look at where it is now. That's one of the park rangers looking at what is happening. 
And just recently, there was a torrential downpour of rain, but they said the ground is so dry that every drop of that rain just got sucked right into the ground because the water levels are so far below the ground. It has to fill up below the ground before it can even get to table level, then to start going above. In one of those cities in California, they said if you were standing at this very same pot in, 20, in this very same location in 2019, you would be 100 feet below water level. But the water has dropped 100 feet, and they said now these towns that people have not seen for decades are reappearing. And you're able to walk across what used to be a lake thriving with water. This is in Utah. Let's go even further. Nine, this, is, this is amazing. This is not even, this is not even, I'm not even making this up. 99.94%, that is the drought in, 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 in Utah. They said 99.94% of their water supply, that's, that's the level of, they call this exceptional drought. That used to be water. And in the distance, it's, received, it's receding and disappearing. This is happening in the West. Let's go even further. That's one side. You see the brown, the white water lines? That's Lake Mead. The water is down 140 feet down. Where the brown line, that's where it used to be. But some people might say, well, 140 feet, that's not that much. But well, let's look at the explanation. They may not seem like much, but six feet of water loss equals 300 billion gallons of water gone for human use. And what else? Hydropower. Hydropower. Meaning the water levels have dropped so low that the water is not even reaching the turbines. So they can't make electricity. It's a, it's, a, it's a rolling, one thing affecting the other. The water is not even up to the turbines, and the lower turbines are not powerful enough to substitute what the turbines in full force can accomplish together. They're, and the turbines here, the power is, is, is powering Colorado. It's powering the states that are below that. So what's happening? No water, no power. Let's go even further. That's a picture of the Colorado Dam, the Hoover Dam which is the water levels, it's normally up to here. It's down, they can't, even, they, they can't even get the turbines to spin because there's not enough water to even go through the turbines. Brethren, these are signs of how the indicators, look at this, this is Lake Mead, 1984 on the left. That was what Lake Mead looked like. This is Lake Mead as of 2020 on the right. It's worse today. That was a year ago. Let's go further. What about the fires, California fires? As one firefighter described it this week, he said, these fires are of biblical proportion. We cannot control them. We cannot stop them, and they are continuing to proliferate. Some set fires, and the embers fly and start a fire someplace else. That's California. Here's Canada. Canada is saying for the first time, they have never had fires like this in their recorded history. But look at the backlash. What do you need to put out fires? <laughs> okay, so if there's not enough water in the West and the fires are in the West, what do you have? A vicious cycle. That's Canada. Let's go on. This is Washington State. The same thing. Washington State is one of the states that may have a forest fire here and there, but they're saying at the very same time they are seeing fires that they have never seen before. The West is going up in flames. As I was talking to Greg Mace last night, I thought he called me to tell me about, because he always calls me to tell me about sound equipment, Moses. You know, he and I, we buy sound equipment, and he's always telling me what's the latest thing. He called me, and from the time he picked up, from the time I answered, his voice was at fever pitch. Oh, my goodness, Johnny, you would not believe. He said, we are surrounded here in Placerville. Our trees are brown. And all it takes is we are one match away from extinction. Pray for us. My mother is worried. That's Lucy Mace, who just recently lost her husband, Max. She said, he said, pray for us. We don't know what to do, and we are praying that we will get rain to somehow. And he said, you know what? The fires are not far away from us. And we don't know what to do. This is in Washington State. Let's go on. I want to I show you what's happening. This is in Oregon, the Oregon fires. The Oregon fires, once again, like all the other in Washington and California and Canada, are out of control. And there are not enough firefighters on the fire lines. They're coming in from all parts of the nation 
But that drought is starting in the west and it's moving slowly toward the east. Uncontrollable fires. And it's so intense, they said that the, 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 the fires in Oregon are so great, it's creating its own weather patterns. Did you hear about that on the news? These clouds are billowing so high that it's creating its own thunderstorms. Well, the vicious cycle of that, when it thunders, it what? And it starts more fires. The lightning from these fires that are made, that these fires produce clouds. Brethren, the earth itself is telling us how near we are to the end. This is New York City and Chicago from the smoke from the West Coast. My sister talked about that the other day. She said, we can't even see here in New York City. This is fires from the West Coast. The smoke is going to Chicago and New York City. Brethren, I want to tell you, God picked this location for us to be living in. Because right now, Jason, all of this impact, see, we complain about rain. Thank God for the rain. Amen, Amen church. Amen. Rain on. Yes, Bring me some more rain. Saturate my grass. My trees are growing so fast I can't even keep. Bring the rain, right, Jeff? Bring the rain. We don't need what they have, but it's moving from the rest. West is moving east, and it's moving east by going north. Places like Montana and Wisconsin and North Dakota, they're getting the backlash of these fires also. God is saying to us, it's time to be awake. Let's not stop there. Let's go to the floods in Europe. Flash floods in Europe. Not, this is not even the one in Germany. This is just in Europe generally. They have flash floods wiping away people's life savings. That is a train surrounded by water. That's a European storm. Let's go to Germany. This is in Germany and Belgium. Flash floods so quickly. These are cars piled one upon the other, wiping away people's savings. And they said, they said the reason why when rain starts, we are not concerned because we've never had this kind of rain before. But they had one year of rain in 24 hours. But this has nothing to do with climate change or fossil fuels. It's coincidental. Let's go on further. This is the Germany floods. Towns are being devastated. By the, this is the aftermath of the floods. This picture talks, this shows how the people are. This is in one of the towns in Germany. They're, they're collecting, they're piling up all the things that the water lines have destroyed. The water levels were washing away people's homes. They said more than 1,000 people possibly have been killed by these floods. And, it's, and it happened before they can even know it. This is in China, where in 25, 25 inches of rain fell in 24 hours. Now, brethren, I'm, I'm not talking about five years ago. This all happened in the last two weeks. 25 inches in 24 hours, the rain was so fast that people were trapped in the subways. They couldn't get out. And they kept the doors closed for fear that the water would come in and drown the passengers, the subways in China. And they said 71 rivers in this province in China have overflowed because of torrential rains. Not just the West Coast, but it's happening in other... And I didn't have all... I mean, I decided to stop here because I didn't want to overwhelm you. I didn't want this to be a complete slideshow. But that's just giving you some indication of where we are in the times of the end. All of creation is groaning and saying that we are living on the verge of a stupendous crisis. What else do the people of God need to see to say God is giving us time to get out and let other people know that Jesus is soon to come? This is the hour of urgency. The Bible warned us of these things. The Lord says in Matthew 24, verse 7, for nation will rise against nation. We've seen that and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines. When the water is washing away the crops and they cannot even grow, the, what happens? Famines. What about pestilences? What do you think COVID-19 is for those that believe it actually exists? What do you think the Delta variant is for those that believe it actually exists? Millions of people have died. In India, they're estimating 3.5 to 4.1 million people have died from the impact of COVID-19. Still, there are people that think it's a hoax, that it's some kind of government plan to control humanity. It may move in that direction because Greg was telling me that already in California, they're suggesting that if you don't get your vaccine by October this year, you may not have the privilege of having your driver's license renewed. Let me tell you, brother, what's on the horizon is greater than you can ever imagine. Something that is just a health crisis is becoming a political manipulative tool. 
and people are losing their freedom to choose or not to choose. You could choose to take it or not to take it. That should be your right, but you should never be impacted in such a way that you begin to lose your freedoms. But it's happening here in America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, really. That used to be the case. The devil is tightening the noose around Earth's neck, and we are seeing a world. This gives you an example. I did include the picture, honey. This is a, this is a, this is an, a crematory ground in one of the locations in India. You see, there's no place to bury the people. So what happens when they die? They take them out and they put them in a pile and they burn them. This is happening all over the major parts of India. And the, and the government says that at least 3.1 to 4 million people have already died. Now they're saying it may not all be COVID-related, but the hospitals are so packed that when people die from whatever the disease is, they have no choice but to cremate them in open air. What's happening in our world today? The Bible says that these things are going to happen more rampant. But I want to make a point today. The climate of the world is no surprise to God. The climate of the world is no surprise to God, but it is in fact a wake-up call to humanity that time is running out for the student of prophecy and those who understand the unfolding eschatological timetable. God is saying we are on the borders of an eternal world. Do you believe that? Amen. So when you study the Bible, what does the Apostle Paul say? Notice what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5. Those of you that are studying, he says, but concerning the times and season, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 to 3. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, what does he say? You have no need that I should write to you. What else can God say to Seventh-day Adventist Christians? He said, you ought to know. I'm seeing people's eyes open, and they're saying, I didn't know this for 40 years, and you knew this? God is going to hold us responsible for what we know that we refuse to tell other people so that they can also know and escape. And like my, my pastor friend said this week when I was saying, you didn't know this? He said, one of the reasons why we don't hear this gospel in all the other churches, and he said, let me make it very simple for you. We just don't know it. We just don't know it. And he walked out of here, Ryan, with a stack of lessons. I'm going to go home and digest this. He said, I, he said, everything you give me, I read. And he said to me, I want you to know that ever since my wife and I met you and your wife, we've changed a lot of things, including the way we eat. And he said with a smile, I'm blaming you for all the changes that have taken place in my life. I want you to know that. <laughs> and I said, to God be the glory. What do you say? When the changes are from darkness to light, from error to truth, we ought to love people enough that we get to know them and get to show them that we care about them. But don't hesitate to bring before them the truth of God's Word. That's what God has called us to do. God has not called us to be comfortable church members sitting in a recline and waiting for Jesus to come and take us to heaven in first class. He's saying, get on the street, hit the streets with the gospel beat and tell people Jesus is coming soon. Urgency. Because I can tell you, there are people by the thousands that were washed away by these floods. As Ellen White says, many are being taken to Christless graves. And that's what the devil desires. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Why? For you yourselves know how perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and what else? safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and you saw it, let's say it together, and they shall not escape. What can we see in these things happening in our world today? What is God saying to us? I go back to a documentary written for our admonition today, and it's amazing when we look at the location of this salutation. Look at this. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 11. 911. Look at this. The condition of things in the world shows that troublous times are right upon us. Why would somebody be angry when they read that? The daily papers are full of indications of a terrible conflict in the near future. Bold robberies, I just showed you that bold robberies 
are frequent occurrences. Strikes and are common. Theft and murders are committed on every hand. Men possessed of demons are taking the lives of men, women, and little children. Men have become infatuated with vice, and every species of evil prevails. That's our world. We go outside and we smell the grass and we say, we're fine. But brethren, you go to any major city. Right now, St. Louis is cracking down again to instill mandatory mask wearing because for whatever reason, they didn't take the vaccination seriously or they didn't take the COVID seriously. And now it's, 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 it's climbing so exponentially that not too far away from us, we got the freedom to choose to wear it or not here in, in the state of Illinois. But a lot of these major cities... And already, the places where people had the choice to take it or not, now, governors and leaders of other states are saying the reason for this surge, they're beginning to blame those who chose not to take the vaccine. Can you see where this is headed? Can you see where this is headed? You'll be hated of all nations if you choose not to coalesce or acquiesce with what the common society is suggesting, you will be maligned. We are living in amazing times. But I say once again, these times are not and should not be a surprise to the people of God. You see, the more instrumental scenario is what we found in the opening scripture. As Moses wrote today, speaking to the Christian, to us today, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. And if you don't believe it, if you don't believe that we are on the verge of the tomorrow war, all you've got to do is refamiliarize yourself with the words of Satan in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. This is his attitude. This is his plan. Revelation 12 verse 17, the King James Version, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, brethren, I am not going to abandon the commandments of God by God's grace. What do you say? Amen. Not just the Sabbath, all of the commandments of God, because there are 10 commandments, not just one. There are 10 commandments. See to it that your life is lived in harmony, and by the grace of God, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Don't be a proponent of just the Sabbath like the Pharisees were and broke all the other nine, but pray for God's Holy Spirit to work in your life obedience that is actuated by a love for Christ, a love for God, and a love for the truth. And when that happens, you are a servant ready for the fire that's coming, ready for the tomorrow war. That's why today, as, gonna, as I take you down to the latter part of the sermon, I'm going to highlight a particular character in the Bible, a man by the name of Joshua. Go to Joshua chapter 11 with me. Because Joshua faced a similar scenario. Joshua is one of my Bible heroes. Joshua is a young man that I cannot wait to meet. Got a lot of heroes in the Bible. I'm surely going to have a lot to talk to about Peter because Peter and I had so much in common. I could talk 500 miles an hour with Gus up to 750. But well, God finally got my mind synchronized to the Holy Spirit. But Joshua was a young man who faced similar situations as we're going to face in the near future. The forces that opposed God were coalescing together against the children of Israel. And God looked down to see if there's a man willing to stand with God to fight against these forces of darkness. And he found a young man by the name of Joshua. Look at Joshua 11, beginning with verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard these things, that he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, to the king of Shimron, to the king of Ashephah, and to the kings who were from the north in the mountains, in the plain south of Chinneroth, in the lowland and in the heights of Dor on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and in the west, the Ammonites or the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, 
the Jebusite. I'm going on further. All of these in the mountain and the Hivite below Hemron in the land of Mizpah. So they went out, they and how many? All their enemies with them, their armies with them, as many people as what? The sand that is on the seashore in multitude with very many horses and chariots. And God said to Joshua, there are a whole lot of them. There's a whole lot of them. They have all coalesced together. And as we sit here today, Satan is constructing the battle of Armageddon. He is looking at the issues. He is seeking to take advantage of things that could be resolved pretty diplomatically, but he's looking at the hearts. He's listening at the chambers of Congress, and he's listening to men that have positions of leadership. He's listening to the thought leaders, to the economists, to those people making decisions about what we can buy or what we cannot buy. He's so ordering things that, as Ellen White says, that the people of God in the future will not have mercy. And somebody might say, well, that sounds like an alarmist. Talking about things that are not going to occur. Well, you can believe that all you want. Thank you, Bob. I'll just say what Bob said. You are asleep and you need to be awakened. <laughs> but the first question I'm going to ask you is, what did Jabin hear? You see, in order for these armies to get together, Jabin, who made the first move to start coalescing them all together, he heard something. Why would you need so many armies, so many kings to coalesce with you, so many bands of military to go and fight against Israel and Joshua? Why would you need so many because the Bible says, and it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard these things. So the question is, what did he hear? What did the enemy hear that he knew he needed to pull all these forces together to fight against this small band of those obedient to God's word? What did he hear? Look at Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 40. This is what Jabin heard. Oh, this is what Jabin heard. So Joshua conquered how much of the land? All the land, the mountain country, and the south, and the lowland, and the wilderness slopes, and all their kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed as the Lord God of Israel had commanded. Now let's, let's put this together. Let's not run too fast. What Jabin heard was, Everybody that stood in the path of the people of God didn't have a chance because God was on their side. Come on, say amen, somebody. He heard that, wait a minute, Joshua is not a one-man army. Joshua has heaven on his side. Let me tell you something, friends. When you've got heaven on your side, you better believe the devil's going to try to find a way to defeat you. So in the near future, he's going to coalesce all these forces together, the kings of the earth and the whole world. He's going to gather them together because he knows he faced Jesus in heaven and lost. Praise God for that. He faced him in the garden and lost again. Faced him at the cross and Jesus came forth victoriously. Praise God for that. And Jesus left and all he had was just a wound on his heel. <laughs> he told the devil, I'm bringing you down. And the Bible says he was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil and the devil himself and release those who all their, all their lifetime were in bondage to fear. So I don't fear anymore. I've taken fear out of my vocabulary. So I could walk into buildings where professional people are and say, God, they said don't walk in here unless you have an appointment. You bigger than that. Amen. 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 I don't need a, I'm here in God. I said, I'm here to talk about an event that's happening on September 11th, and I want to talk to somebody about advertising. Come on in. God can bring down walls that man erects. And let me tell you, 
while we're talking about plans, I can tell you the devil's going to try to find his way to mess it up. If you don't think that, I told you a few weeks ago, whenever there are opportunity, there'll always be opposition. But whenever there's opposition, there's omnipotence, and it's called God. So as we prepare for tomorrow war, we must remember that God gave Joshua victory, and he will give us victory. The world may be falling apart and its resources drying up, but in the kingdom of heaven, there is no crisis, Terry. There's no crisis. But get this, God gave Joshua victory. But look at God's promise to us. God's, the Bible says, and Joshua conquered. But look what God's promise to us. Romans 8 and verse 37. Romans 8 and verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. Joshua conquered, but with Christ we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. I don't want to just be a conqueror. In Jesus, I want to be more than a conqueror. What do you say? You can conquer whatever you're faced with. In Christ, you can be more than conquerors through him who loved us. You see, Joshua did not fear his enemies. His enemies feared him. <laughs> Sometimes Adventists think, well, you know, I don't want to get people upset. You can't be a Seventh-day Adventist if you don't want to get folk upset. I'm not talking about offending people. Understand me. But the Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, the fearful and unbelieving will have their part in the lake of fire. What does that mean? Fearful of telling the truth. When you tell the truth lovingly, when you wrap the truth in the love of Christ, you don't need to follow that up with an apology because the Lord will take that seed of love and compassion and find a willing heart that just did not know Brethren, we can't think of other people and other denominations being our enemies. We've got to think of them as our brothers and sisters in Christ. They love the Lord like you do, and maybe some of them love the Lord more than you do. Some of them are living up to what they have, and they're dedicated with all their heart. Like my pastor friend says, I've, learned, I've known the Lord all my life, but God has chosen to bring me to this point where he can bring me out of darkness into this marvelous light. That's what God wants to do. So don't look at people of other denominations as your enemies. That's not your enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the forces of darkness. That's why hell was not created for anybody that Jesus created with his own hands. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Don't be determined to join him in that final bonfire. But when you see people in Walmart and wherever you go, you may not be the kind of person to walk up to folk, but if you have a Facebook page, you could post something to lead them to light. If you've got Instagram, put some links on there. Stop putting pictures of yourself. Who cares what you look like? <laughs> put something that will show them who Jesus is. Link some lessons from Amazing Facts or from 3ABN's The Bible Questions. Put some videos on there that when people watch it, they'll learn something more than they have known before. Be an instrument of goodness. That's why the Lord said to Joshua in Joshua 10 and verse 25, notice what he said to Joshua. When Joshua went out to battle, you see, you see the, the kings that were about to come up against Joshua had heard. What did they hear? Look at Joshua 10 and verse 25. And Joshua said to them, that is to his army of Israelites, do not be afraid nor be dismayed. What else should we be? Be strong and of what? Good courage. For thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. I'm telling you, I'm not thirsty for casualties. I want souls for the kingdom. But if you stand in the way of a soul for the kingdom, you'll be a casualty. There is no third category. Either you are with God or you are against him. Either you're gathering with him or you're scattering abroad. There is no third category. That's why when we see the conditions of the world, it should not create in us fear. Because the Lord made it very clear. What you see in the world is just a harbinger of the soon coming of Jesus. Mark 13, 29. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the door. Some of these children wait for Christmas and, you know, people say it's right around the corner. I grew up hearing that phrase. That always irritated me as a kid because I want to go around the corner. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
Christmas is right around the corner. And I said, what corner? Let me make it clear. The coming of Jesus is right around the corner. The world knows it. Nature understands it. All creation is groaning, waiting for the world to go through an extreme makeover. You see, God is going to put to an end all the systems and replace them with his system. And distress indicates how near the coming of Jesus is. Look at the apostle Luke, what he says. Luke 21, 25, here's these words, prophetic words, certain words. He says, Luke 21, 25, and 26, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth. What else, friends? Distress, Distress of nations. We're seeing that with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. And what else? Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be what? The powers of heaven will be shaken. While the world is being shaken, dark forces are consolidating together. But what did Joshua do when he knew that the forces of darkness were consolidating together? Look what he did. Joshua 11 and verse 5. The Bible says, When all these kings had met together, they came and camped together at the waters of Miram to fight against Israel. When they had this summit coming up in November, I'm wondering what the end result of that summit is going to be. Because the summer, the climate summit that's coming up in November, that's going to take the place, that's going to take place in Scotland and also in the United States and in one other location. This climate summit is going to suggest, and as, and I'll show you the quote in a moment here, our political leaders are saying that Pope Francis has a moral obligation to persuade the world that we need to unite and put into measures those things that we believe will save our planet. Did somebody not tell him that God is about to carry out an extreme makeover of this planet? They don't have to fix anything, Jay. God is going to fix it. What do you say? Behold, I saw a new heaven and a what else? A new earth. So they don't have to fix anything. But what you know what's driving this? This belief that is prevalent in evangelicalism and Christianity, that they believe that Jesus is going to come and reign on the earth. So they got to get it ready for him to come and reign. He already came down here. Let me make a statement. Not even aliens want to come down here. Why would an alien want to come to San Francisco and risk getting robbed? <laughs> they don't exist. That's my point. But Jesus is not coming to reign on this corrupt earth. He's going to purify this earth and replace it with a kingdom where sin will never rise up his head again. But Pope Francis is going to be there. And Reuters News brings out this statement about what's coming up to us. Look at what it says. Reuters News, May 15th, 2021. He says, Pope Francis has the moral authority to sway public opinion over what? Global warming and might attend the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Scotland. He has the what? Moral authority to sway opinion. Oh, look what it goes on further to say. It says, um, U.S. President Joe Biden, who also is Catholic, and climate envoy John Kerry said on Saturday, this was a recent interview, May 15th, but it goes on further to say, because he, that is the Pope, is above politics and outside of the hurly-burly of day-to-day -day national conflict, I think he can sort of shake people a little bit and bring them to the table with a better sense of our common obligation, carry at it. In other words, Pope Francis, we need you to shake up the world a little bit. Get people to the table. Let them know what their obligation is. You know what my obligation is? To preach Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, risen again, and soon coming. That's our obligation. Not trying to fix planets, clean up cities. 
It is our obligation to be stewards of what God has given to us, but our obligation is above that. When we know, but what I'm seeing in this is the fulfillment of Revelation chapter 17. God is in charge of the final movements. Nothing is happening outside of the commanding hand of God. He said, I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying I will do all my pleasure. Brethren, God is still in charge. Nothing is happening outside of God's ability to orchestrate the final movements. Look at Revelation 17 and verse 17. This is what Revelation tells us. We might see declining conditions. That may be the catalyst, but God is still in charge. Revelation 17, 17. Why would they get together? For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill what? His purpose, to be of one mind and get this, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. What beast? That beast described in Revelation chapter 13, that beast upon which the woman sits in Revelation chapter 17, the power of political and religious Rome. God is saying, give that beast your power and authority because I'm about to fulfill my will to God be the glory. God is in charge. So when you consider the kings of the earth and the world gathering together, it could be daunting until you read Joshua's diary. Here it is, Jason, Joshua's diary. Joshua's diary. We find in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5 these words. What should we be expected? What, the people of God, what should the people of God expect? Look what the Lord said to Joshua. Joshua 1 and verse 5. No man, say that with me again, friend. No man shall be able to stand before you in all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you together. I will not leave you nor forsake you. That's where that comes from. God's not going to leave us. God's not going to forsake us. Don't be fearful because he goes on further in Joshua 11 and verse 6. Let's wind up the story here. Notice what the Lord does. So God's saying, I am with you. So when Joshua hears about the consolidating armies, Look at Joshua 11, verse 6. But the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid because of them. Look at the next word. For when? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Say it again. When? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, Ricky. When, friend? Tomorrow. About this time. In other words, when the tomorrow war begins, about this time, what does the Lord say? I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. And this is amazing to me. And you shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Not even the horses are going to get away. And sometimes we get sidetracked by, you know, military technology. I'm one of those geeks. I may not look like it. But I like to read about all those highly technical things, you know, those, those new jets and those those uh, stealth battleships, those $20 million under-radar planes that America is... I, you know, anybody else like that? Am I the only one? I like to read that kind of stuff. You know, techie guys, ooh, you know, how fast is it? Well, you don't know it's, you don't know it's coming until it left. <laughs> you don't believe me. Remember the Gulf War? Saddam Hussein didn't know what was going to hit him until the plane's already left. I like to read that stuff, and, you know, it does this, and it moves at this speed of sound, and it has this technology, and it could find things, and I'm thinking, wow. And it could see you when you don't even know, and it could, it could pick up a, 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 a posted stamp from 60,000 feet in high definition. I'm thinking, so how are we going to hide? <laughs> God's got a secret place for us, what do you say? You think that man can create an arsenal you stand on God's side. Amen. When the armies of the enemies came up against Israel, God said, how many angels do we need for this battle? We just need one. How many do they have? 185,000. Ah, just go ahead and send an angel. Put your sandwich down. Go ahead and deal with it and come back and finish it. That angel went down and wiped out all the army. Whew. 
and came back and finished his meal. Let me tell you something, friends. Man may have technology, but God can hide his people under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. Look what he did to Joshua. Joshua 11, verse 7 and 8. And I just have a few more scriptures, but it's the Sabbath, so relax. So Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly by the waters of Maram, and they attacked them. Why at the waters of Maram? Because that's where they gathered together to attack Joshua and Israel. But Joshua became proactive and says, we're not waiting for you to come at us. We're coming at you. And verse 8, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who defeated them and chased them to greatest Sidon, to the brook, what? Misrephoth, and to the valley of Mizpah eastward, and they attacked them until they left none of them remaining. When the great controversy is over, there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more hospitals, no more disease, no more plagues, no more COVID-20, 21, 22, 23, or 24. There'll be no violence, no crime, no drying up lakes, no burning forests. There'll be no funerals, no cities that are on the verge of collapse. There'll be no multiple grave sites. There'll be peace forevermore because wherever you look from north to south, east to west, God is going to create a city that is filled with peace. And you'll look for wicked and evil men and they will no longer be found. Can the church say amen? amen. You see, the outcome of the tomorrow war is already written. David the psalmist said it in Psalm 37, verse 9 and 10. Look what he says in Psalm 37, verse 9 and 10. And I'm going to invite Pharaoh to come and just play softly for me in just a moment here. The outcome of tomorrow's war is already written. Psalm 37, verse 9 and 10. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those who do what, friends? Wait on the Lord. They shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. What do you say? No more sin, no more suffering. When the tomorrow war is over, all the opposing armies will expire with it. God will clear the battlefield, and the results will be final. Affliction will not rise up a second time. But I want to give you this last quotation before I close. Testimonies for the Church, once again, volume 9, page 11. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. Plagues and judgments are already filling, falling upon the despises of the grace of God, the calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarm of war are portentous. They forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be rapid ones. What happened when Joshua did what God called him to do? The battle was swift and rapid, but the outcome was to the glory of God. What did Joshua do? You see, the battle that Joshua faced is the battle that God fought through Joshua. Joshua 11, verse 9 to 11. So Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. 
he hamstringed their horses and burned their chariots with fire, meaning all the forces that come up against God's people will be of no impact at all. God is going to hold them back. In other words, God is going to hamstring the tanks and the military forces. Every move made to try to prevent God's church from succeeding, he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Verse 10 said, Joshua turned back at that time and took Hazor and struck its kings with the sword, for Hazor was formerly the head of all those kingdoms. Why does it say formerly? <laughs> because Hazor was no longer the head of those kingdoms. Hazor was formerly the head of the, all those kingdoms. And it says, they struck all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword that is with God's word. The sword is God's word, utterly destroying them. How? With truth. There was none left breathing. Then he burned Hazel with fire. One day God is going to purify this earth with fire. And the only remnants of the wicked and sin will be ashes under the soles of our feet on the day that God does that. That's why, brethren, we've got time now. God has given us time as a church to get busy with getting the message out to lost souls all around us. Some of them love the Lord, but they don't know what God has revealed to us. And God is saying, this is the hour. Get that sword out and sharpen it and let the Word of God be the battle tool in your arm to reach tender hearts, minds that are willing, people that are dissatisfied with the hype of religion and they want something more. God is saying, this is the time. You see, the first step in victory is creating a coalition with your ally. And today, we need to create a coalition with our ally, and his name is Jesus. You, David the psalmist says in Psalm 46, verse 6 and 7, the nations raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted, and the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. There will be a tomorrow war. However, we will not give the victory to God, but God will give the victory to us. But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. My brethren, let me ask you the question. Where do you want to stand in the final movements of the last days? If you want to stand on the side of those who want to be on the battlefield for the Lord, if you want to do your part in getting the world ready, God will give you the directive. What he tells me to do may not be what he tells you to do. What he tells you to do may not be what he tells me to do. But if in one capacity or the other, you want to be involved in getting other people ready for the coming of Jesus, will you stand with me? Paul says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. There is going to be a tomorrow war, but there's going to be a tomorrow victory. There's going to be a tomorrow war, and there's going to be a tomorrow victory because Jesus has already won the battle. He's already won the victory over death and the grave. He's already captured even death itself. He's already broken free from the tomb that bound him for those three days. And now he wants to hand the victory over to his church. It's going to get tough before it gets easy. But when you stand with God, the tomorrow war is God's war. It's not yours. But if you stand with him, the tomorrow victory will be yours. It's not just God's. Our Heavenly Father, we ask, first of all, we praise you. We thank you. We consider what you've done for us, and we remember if God is for us, who and what can be against us? Lord, we have been given the sword not to cut people up, but to inform them, enlighten them, 
to cut away error and insert truth. And as you've used this sword in the garden of temptation, it is written, it is written, it is written. May we know what is written so that when we put on the whole armor of God, we can stand firm with the weapon of our warfare, with the word of God, with the undeniable truth of your word, with a sword that has never, ever become dull. May we study your word. May we hide it in our hearts. May we live by it and communicate it. And when we sound that battle cry, when we say that we are in it to win it, may we understand we can only win it as we stand with Jesus. And so we thank you, Lord, that yes, there's going to be a war tomorrow, but you've already won it in your precious and holy righteousness. And we thank you in the name of Jesus and God's people said, Amen.